Thanks, Karen, and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to speak to you today. And thank you all for sticking around to the bitter end of the meeting uh, on a Sunday morning. So, uh, as Karen mentioned, I'm Steve Spellman. I am the Vice President of Research at the, at the National Maradona Program and a Senior Scientific Director in the CIBMTR. So I'm going to be talking to you this morning about improving or overcoming HLA barriers to transplant access. So. Just in, by way of outline, I'll talk a bit about how we've defined optimal matching for allogeneic transplant with examples from both uh, unrelated donor transplantation as well as cord blood transplantation, uh, discussing how we can close that donor availability gap and ensuring that we have a donor for all patients in need, truly getting to a point where we can democratize cell therapy, and then talk a little bit about future directions. Um, so just to start, uh, our current understanding of unrelated donor transplant matching has evolved over time. Um, I'm showing data here from 2004, but there's a story behind this data. And just to give you a bit of background to talk through this, the National Maradona Program was formed in 1987 and was started as a research program. So we started a research database as well as a biorepository to bank pre-transplant samples from donors and recipients that were proceeding to transplant through the NMDP. Our knowledge of HLA matching at the time was quite limited um, by the technology that was available mainly serologic typing for HLA class 1, uh, some DRB1, DNA-based typing at the time. Uh, but there was a project that was launched with funding from the Office of Naval Research through the National Maradona Program called the Donor Recipient Pair Project, where we were able to go back into the freezers, pull out samples, and really develop the methodology to be able to do high-resolution HLA typing of, of of those uh, donors go back and understand the match grade between the donor and the recipient that prior to transplant and evaluate the outcomes. Um, so that was quite a, it took quite a while to develop those methodologies. That project was kicked off in 1994 and the first publication was in 2004. So it was a decade long uh, uh, initiative here to get to this point. First study was led by Neil Flamenberg at Thomas Jefferson um, and Dan Weisdorf at the University of Minnesota. The study population was about a little over 1,800 patients, US transplants from 1988 to 1996. Uh, transplanted for AML, ALL, CML, or other malignancies. We kind of took all comers in this, in this first analysis because there wasn't a lot of unrelated donor transplant that was being done at the time. Uh, all receive, and the vast majority received transplants for CML, uh, which we don't transplant a lot for anymore because there are other more effective first-line therapies and curative therapies. So, um, so vast majority was CML, all received bone marrow, that was the only unrelated donor graft source that was available at the time. 100% uh, received myeloblative transplants and our medium follow-up was nine years. The main takeaway from that first analysis where we were able to evaluate HLA A, B, C, and DRB1 high resolution matching, and when I say high resolution matching, I'm talking about uh, uh, identity at exon 2 in class 1 and exons 2 and 3 at class 2. What we saw was about a 10% decrement in survival with a mismatch at one of those main loci. We also considered HLA DQB1, DQA1, DPA1, and DPB1, but there wasn't sufficient power to really evaluate those. So the main takeaway being an 8 of 8 match is superior to a 7 of 8 match, which is superior to a 6 of 8 match. This study was followed seven years later where we had those, the typing was really kind of moving along at that point. We were able to double the size of the population, so bringing forward uh, the Flamenberg cohort and include transplants from 88 to 2003 and getting to a population of about nearly 4,000 transplants. Uh, again, uh, CML was the predominant disease, but we were seeing much more acute leukemia um, um, and transplants for acute leukemia at this time as well. Again, all myeloblative conditioning. And we started to see the first use of peripheral blood stem cells at this time, accounting for about 6% of the population. Median follow-up was six years. And the findings were quite similar. And here we were seeing about a 10% decrement of survival for each mismatch at HLA A, B, C, or D or B1 at the high resolution level. Also considered HLA DQB1, we did not see an effect of DQB1 on any outcomes in this analysis 
analysis. HLA-DP B1 was not associated with overall survival, but there was kind of a yin and yang of HLA-DP, where mismatching at HLA-DP leads to better relapse control, but higher rates of non-relapse mortality, uh, mainly associated with higher rates of, of graft versus host disease, so losing that, that benefit there on overall survival. So this really kind of established the the eight of eight matching level that we currently use for much, much of our matching for unrelated donors and matching at extended loci if, if there are uh, additional donors available for selection. This has been validated in, in many different analyses. I'm just showing a European cohort here that was uh, published by Daniel First and his group from Germany. Again, showing about that 10% decrement in survival between an eight of eight match and a seven of eight match. And here they segregated whether it was an allele level match or an antigen level match. If it's a mismatch at high resolution, it's, it's uh, problematic in this setting. And this is all calcineurin inhibitor based GVHD prophylaxis. I should also note that because that seems to be changing the paradigm a bit in the modern age. Um, this has also been, so we've seen this in Europe. We've also evaluated this in pediatric populations, non-malignant populations, considered bone marrow versus peripheral blood stem cell grafts and see consistent results. Now, what about cord blood transplant? So there's been many studies on cord blood looking at the impact of matching. This particular study was led by Mary Epen, published in The Lancet in 2007, uh, comparing the outcomes of unrelated donor umbilical cord blood transplant to bone marrow in children with acute leukemia and showing that an eight of eight match cord, or a well-matched cord, here matching was defined at antigen level for HLA A and B and a high resolution at HLA D or B1, a six of six match leading to a great outcome in a very small population, 35 patients that were included in this analysis. But when you compare well-matched or uh, single mismatched uh, cord blood or double mismatched cord blood, it, it compared quite favorably to uh, bone marrow transplant in this population. This was also seen in an adult population, another publication from the CIBMTR led by Mary Epen and the Eurocord team, uh, published in Lancet Oncology in 2010. Again, showing cord blood uh, um, comparing quite favorably at the four of six to six of six level in adults uh, when you compare it to adult graft sources. Now, what about looking at higher resolution typing in, in cord blood? So this was a, a follow-on study from 2013 where we had uh, retrospective typing on, on a, a, a the vast majority of these samples, but then also were able to impute uh, high resolution matching within a cohort of 1,600 donor recipient, roughly 1,600 donor recipient pairs, mainly transplanted for acute leukemia and myelodysplastic syndrome. Transplanted between 2000 and 2010, all receiving single cord blood units. Myeloblative conditioning and calcineurin inhibitor based GVHD prophylaxis. Now, the main endpoint in this study was looking at non relapse mortality, and we do see that gradation of match level with 8 of 8 not being available for most patients, but a 7 of 8 and 6 of 8 comparing quite favorably, and a 5 of 8 and a 4 of 8 segregating for uh, non relapse mortality with uh, increased risk with more mismatching in the 3 of 8 setting. Um, when we look at the impact of cell dose, as long as you were achieving a cell dose of greater than three, there did not seem to, uh, to be much benefit of, of going above and beyond that. So that was shown in the seven of eight, six of eight, and five of eight populations. Uh, so suggesting that higher resolution matching uh, may be better in the cord setting as well. This has all been codified in various donor, donor and core blood selection guidelines. I'm just uh, highlighting here the most recent from the National Marrow Donor Program and the CIBMTR on the left. This was published in Blood in 2019, as well as the guidelines for core unit selection from the ASTCT SIG that was published in, in uh, uh, the Journal of Transplant and Cellular Therapy, or could have been BBMT at the time, actually, with prior to the name change. Um, so these are evidence-based recommendations to optimize outcomes. There are slight variations between these with the, the NMDP CIBMTR guidelines that preceded the, the SIG guidelines uh, recommending a greater than 2.5 times 10 to the 7th uh, kilogram dose versus a 3 times 10 to the 7th in the STCT guidelines. Now, what has this meant for patients over time? And so just to illustrate improvements in outcome, I'm just showing a representative population here. These are patients that were under the age of 50, receiving myeloablative conditioning for acute leukemia and remission or myelodysplastic syndrome. And between 
between the years of 1990 and 2015, we've seen about a 6% increase in, one, in the odds of one year survival. Uh, on average over that time frame. Now, is that all due to donor choice and uh, donor selection and modification? Well, no. Supportive care has improved as well. Uh, but donor selection optimization has had a significant contribution to this. And we continue to see this as well in a more contemporary setting. Um, and so what I'm illustrating here is the impact of donor type on one-year mortality for transplants done between 2017 and 2019, reported in the CIBMTR center-specific outcome analysis. Now that is a, uh, a HRSA deliverable that's required, it's benchmarking for transplant center performance. Um, considering all first allogeneic transplants performed within the U.S., this includes over t approximately 25,000 transplants in this three-year period. And what I'm showing is the odds ratio of mortality risk that's pulled from the multivariate model. So the sibling donors here, shown as the baseline in, in blue, um, as, as one, being significantly better than um, than um, matched unrelated or and and alternate and mismatched alternative graft sources, but when we compare, so we see a bit of a step down or an increasing risk with the level of mismatching that that is used. Um, so optimal choice, gold standard. If you have a matched sibling donor, first choice. If you have a matched unrelated donor, lower risk of mortality, and then significant step down for all of the alternative graft sources. And this is taking all comers. So this is in aggregate between in this, in this large real world evidence uh, cohort. Now, not everybody is going to have a matched sibling donor available. If we could just use the, the rough estimate of about 30%, knowing that that varies by, by ethnic background, as well as a 29% to 79% likelihood of having a matched unrelated donor available. So all of those that don't are, are are looking, uh, are, are have to select between the alternative mismatch donor choices. So what are those optimal choices and how do we determine what they happen to be? Um, and so what does this look like from a race and ethnicity standpoint? And just showing the, the, the distribution based on matched unrelated donor availability. And this takes into account the availability of the donor. It's not just existence of a match on the registry. It accounts for the likelihood of the donor being called at the time. Of, of, of need. And that ranges from 29% in the African American population up to 79% in, in the um, white non-Hispanic population. And this reflects, well, the composition of the registry, the diversity of HLA within these various populations. So what, what can be done to, to close this gap? And this accounts for about 35% of all transplants that are currently being reported to the CIBMTR. So the most recent data here from 2020 showing about 35% of all patients receiving a mismatched graft source. And this issue is going to continue to expand. So this is data from the Pew Center, uh, a slide that was shared by, uh, with me by Stephanie Lee at Fred Hutch, showing that we definitely have a change in the demographics within the population, that registries need to reflect that. But can we, can we recruit our way out of this issue? Well, likely not. This was a thought experiment that was done by Martin Myers in our bioinformatics research team at the, at the uh, CIBMTR, looking at a hypothetical situation. So considering that there are 40 million African American um, males in the US, 11.3 million of them are aged 18 to 35. 300,000 are already represented on the registry. Let's say we added the other 11 million to the registry. Uh, and assuming 100% availability, where, where would we end up? Well, at best, we're going to get to 63.7% uh, matches for that population. So a substantial gap remains. So what's to be done with that? Well, we could look at, so I'm going to share some registry modeling detail um, uh, based on some uh, models that were initially published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013 have been updated uh, in 2018 for, for HRSA and 
We are currently in, in uh, the process of reapplying for uh, the HRSA contract, uh, but HRSA is, has expressed interest in repeating these analyses in, in the coming contract period. But just to, to baseline here, our adult donor modeling is adjusted for donor availability based on historic rates that have been found, seen within NMDP for the various racial and ethnic groups. Looking at matching at high resolution at HLA A, B, C, and D or B1, I'm mainly going to focus on eight of eight matches here. And then cord bud modeling considering minimum cord dosing with a dose of three times 10 to the seventh. Yes, I know CD34 is used often, uh, and more often nowadays, but uh, this was the, the state of the data at the time. And then considering patient weight and deciles. Uh, so looking at pediatric and adult considered separately, looking at the overall inventory and the percent that met uh, the TNC dose in those various buckets, and then looking at matching at high resolution down to the five of eight level. These are the populations that were evaluated. These were all defined using self-identified race and ethnicity from donor recruitment questionnaires. I'm not gonna read this. I will just go right through and show some of the modeling. So here's a couple of the scenarios that I'll, I'll, be, I'll be describing today. The first is, on the left, is an, considering an 8 of 8 match to begin with, not having an 8 of 8 match, then pursuing a cord blood for at an 8 of 8, 7 of 8, 6 of 8, or 5 of 8 level, or a cord only scenario. Looking at scenario one, 8 of 8 matching with adults on the left, and this is single cord blood unit only. So if we were considering double cord, uh, transplant where you have a lower uh, TNC threshold, you have a, a donor available for nearly 100%. But when we consider uh, single cord blood availability, about 50, ranges from about 55% to, to nearly 95% in the adults, and from 80% to nearly 100%. In, in pediatric population. When we look at cord only, about 55% to, to nearly 90% in, in uh, the adults, and then moving to 80% uh, 80, 80 to nearly 100% in the cord. So showing how cord blood can really close that gap of access within these populations. And this is African American on the left, nor, yeah, and non-Hispanic white on the right to give you a sense of, of that group with other ethnic groups in the middle, uh, showing the gradation there. So what can be done there? Well, can you, uh, what about eliminating the cell dose barrier? Cell dose does limit the uh, availability of units for adults. Um, to have a, a single unit that's sufficient. So there's different strategies that have been described this, this weekend uh, at the meeting, one being CD34 selected haplo along with the cord, or various cord blood expansion protocols. So the potential to use a better HLA matched unit and a lower dose unit. Um, so what would that mean? So here I'm gonna walk through eight of eight down to five of eight. So at the eight of eight level, um, not seeing as much of a benefit at the seven of eight, really starting to see it. Six of eight, we're nearly getting to 100%, and then when we get to a five of eight match, there's a cord available for all donors in need. And this is considering no dose. And I, I realize in the, in the expansion protocols and the, and the haplo setting that we are using uh, certain minimum thresholds of TNC, but this is, this is more for illustrative purposes. Um, so this is illustrating how cord blood can really close that gap. And with a five of eight match unit available for nearly 99% of all potential patients. Now, the other benefit of cord blood is looking at matching within and outside of racial and ethnic groups. This has implications for recruitment as well as for a, a potential to find a match. Uh, this is just, uh, I'll illustrate both an African American and a Hispanic, a uh, white uh, Hispanic population just to illustrate the effect here. But of all the cords that were distributed through the National Marrow Donor Program from, t um, from 2010 to 2020, what we see is about 41% are race ethnicity matched in the African American population. So more than 50% are coming from groups outside of the race ethnicity of the patient. We see a similar, uh, uh, a similar distribution in the Hispanic recipients as well, with nearly 50% coming from within the racial ethnic group and nearly 50 per, and uh, slightly more than 50% coming from without. Um, so that, pen, that potential to find those matches outside 
of your race ethnicity, ethnicity group. So recruiting ethnically diverse patients or donors uh, for, your, for your cord blood inventory really benefits all patients at the end of the day with the permissibility of the mismatching and the tolerance of the mismatching that's been seen within the use of cord blood transplant. Now, the next thing I wanted to show was, was trends over time in utilization of graft source. So this is not just, not just numerical, this is the proportion of graft sources that are used, considering matched unrelated, mismatched unrelated, haploidentical, and cord blood. And we see a bit of an inflection point here in roughly 2013, where use of cord blood in the, in the black African American population switched. We saw more increase in the use of, of uh, haploidentical transplant with the advent of post-transplant cyclophosphamide-based GVHD prophylaxis strategies, as well as alpha-beta T-cell depletion uh, and other, other ways to manipulate those graphs. And this has eroded the use of cord blood as well as mismatched unrelated donor transplants over time. This is a similar, um, a similar trend was seen in white Hispanic uh, patients as well. Um, and some of this, well, as Dr. Horwitz uh, earlier in the meeting mentioned the 1102 study uh, suggesting that cord versus haplo, no difference in the primary endpoint, but the, but the field seemed to have made some decisions already. And before that trial even, even took off, we, we started to see some trends in, in this respect. And maybe not with sufficient evidence to really determine what is that optimal graft source for a patient in need. And so with that, I'm just going to note that with all of these additional options, we really have a donor available for everybody. What work, the work that needs to be done now is really determining what the best match is in each situation for each of those patients. Like in the case of active MRD in acute leukemia, maybe cord is the best option for that particular patient. We need to do those studies to better understand that and really optimize that donor choice. And so that's where the, the power of the registry comes in. And this is work that is, that is underway to really understand that. So in, in closing, I just wanted to, to hope I shared some insights on HLA matching impacts and expanded donor choice that's improved over time. Uh, and that HLA mismatch donor cord blood options can expand access to transplant, eliminating that donor availability gap. So at the time of consultation, that should never really be that, that uh, consideration. Is the patient a candidate for transplant? You can find a graft source that'll suit their needs. Um, cord blood expansion can, uh, has the potential to further uh, access by reducing those cell dose limitations. And further studies are really needed to determine the optimal donor choice and individualizing it to each patient as we go forward. So getting to that precision medicine uh, type approach to really un understand the characteristics of the patient, their disease, and what graft source is going to lead to the best outcome for them in any given situation. So we want to get to the point where we have a donor available for all in need. I think we are, we are there. We are able to do that at this point for the vast majority of patients and now just need to move forward and optimize that uh, for all for all situations. With that, I just want to acknowledge my teams at the, at the National Marrow Donor Program as well as the CIBMTR, all of the donors and patients that have contributed over the years as well as those, those cord blood mothers, as well as our funding agencies and in particular the Office of Naval Research that has been instrumental in funding much of the histocompatibility research that we have done. Through, uh, through the NMDP and the CIBMTR. So I'll close there and uh, pass off to Dr. Ballin for her talk and I believe we'll be taking questions at the end. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, that, that was great. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about non-HLA barriers uh, to transplant and I have no conflicts to disclose. So I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about economic and healthcare disparity in the US, and most of what I'm talking about is based on data from the US, but I think it can apply uh, worldwide. Uh, talk about access to transplant care. What is the role of cord blood to improve healthcare disparity? Some outcome data, and what can we do to improve the situation moving forward? So just for fun, um, 
Um, the CBA budget doesn't allow for one of those fancy electronic things, but we can do by a show of hands. Uh, the richest county in the U.S. is it Fairfax County, suburb of D.C., Fairfield, suburb of New York City, Loudoun County, uh, in Northern Virginia, or Marin County uh, in California. So any takers for Fairfax? All right. Fairfield, Connecticut, Loudoun, and Marin. Ah, well, it's out in Loudoun County, Virginia. Typical home. <laughs> Uh, this is the area, it's about 30 miles west of D.C., and um, for Americans, it is the area where many of our elected officials have their horse farms. Um, and uh, actually, Fairfax County, right next door, is the third richest. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, the poorest county in the U.S., Holmes County, Mississippi, Grayson County in southwest Virginia, Buffalo County in South Dakota, McDowell County in West Virginia. Any takers for Holmes? Grayson? Buffalo? And McDowell? Yeah, it's actually Holmes County in Mississippi. Um, uh, median income, $12,000. Uh, median family income, $12,000. Um, I show this uh, because Grayson County, also in Virginia, is the third poorest, and so some of the data that we'd be looking at in the state of Virginia really runs the spectrum of economic um, uh, disparity. So as we know, transplant curative treatment for many patients with AML. We started our initial work um, with some estimates actually uh, from NMDP that less than 50% of patients who could benefit from a transplant might actually end up receiving one. And Virginia is a state of 9 million people, most of whom, um, vast majority, live within 100 miles of a transplant center, so it's not necessarily that type of geographic access that's an issue. And as I mentioned, Virginia is the richest county in the U.S. and also some of the poorest in southwest Virginia, part of Appalachia. And hopefully studying access in Virginia may give us insight into other areas in the U.S. and throughout the world. So we looked at a study at what is the difference in access to transplant in the richest and poorer areas in the U.S. And this was to bring awareness to healthcare disparity, uh, to design some metrics to track areas of poor health care access, um, and we selected Virginia given that we had access to data from the state and the vast uh, urban and rural areas and wealthy and poor areas. We did not look at transplant outcomes in this initial study. Um, and we know that it's difficult for patients to access a transplant center. That could be physician availability, issues at the center, patient factors, including transportation, caregiving, and maybe more difficult for older patients who, of course, are the majority of patients with AML. So we compared state data on the incidence of AML with CIBMTR data on the number of transplants. And this analysis was performed by our colleagues um, at the NMDP. Um, and we studied difference in transplant access based on geographic region, race and ethnicity, and socioeconomic factors. And we observed major differences in access to care based on geographic region. Uh, this was published by one of our fellows, Joey Mock, last year in TCT. Um, and so that area um, in, in northern Virginia there, that's the area west of D.C. Uh, this is actually where University of Virginia is in Charlottesville, that's Richmond. And this area here in southwest Virginia, that really tail there close to Tennessee, that is all part of Appalachia. Um, and what we see is that if you live in the north, you have a much better chance of getting a transplant for the same disease than if you live here in the south. And then we looked at the state in terms of the percent of African Americans in each region. And so this area in the western part of the state has um, an African American population of less than 25%. This area here in southwest Virginia is old coal mining country, very rural, white, uh, rural poor. This area is Richmond and south of Richmond with a higher African American population of greater than 25% 
and a transplant rate of only 15%. So those areas of the state that had a higher African American population had a very low rate of getting to transplant for AML. We then looked at something called the Social Vulnerability Index, or SVI. Um, this is uh, developed by the CDC to identify at-risk populations during natural disasters, such as hurricanes and earthquakes. It's actually currently used by the National COVID Task Force and includes, it's a composite index that includes information on socioeconomic status, household composition and disability, minority status and language barriers, housing and transportation and education, but really hadn't been well used in transplant or in cancer studies. And um, so we um, employed this SVI, um, actually at the suggestion of some of the statistical uh, help at the NMDP, and found that those population areas that had a higher social vulnerability index had a decreased rate of getting to transplant, and that was highly statistically significant. So the conclusions from this Virginia transplant access study is that we see tremendous variability in transplant access even in one state. Communities with a higher African American population have poorer access to transplant. I didn't show this data, but those areas of the state that had a higher education level had private rather than government insurance or had a higher rate of uh, patients that were married or had a stable partner of any gender associated with a higher access to transplant. And of course, the latter may be due to caregiving requirements at transplant centers. And then another conclusion was that the social vulnerability index may be a useful tool to identify communities in need of more resources for cancer care. And in fact, at our center now, we're looking at this now in patients with multiple myeloma. Um, and clearly, I think we would all agree that there's much room for improvement here. So how can cord blood help with access to transplant care? We all know it's a readily available stem cell source. I'm going to be reviewing some studies from the CIBMTR that show comparable survival for black African American patients who receive cord blood or haplo and an NMGP analysis that shows comparable survival after cord blood transplants for adults with different race and ethnicities. So this is a study that was published uh, by Dr. Solomon uh, with the CIBMTR analysis and looked uh, only at black African American patients, um, obviously retrospective study, not randomized, uh, looked at both haplo and cord between the um, years of 2008 and 2016 for patients with hematologic malignancy. Graft versus host disease and transplant related mortality was higher for cord blood, but overall survival, disease free survival was comparable. And a conclusion of the study was that either haplo or cord blood expands access for African American patients. And this is the data from this study. So um, on the left, um, um, on the left, uh, we see that uh, there was um, a higher incidence of transplant-related mortality in the cord at 31% uh, versus haplo. Relapse was similar. Um, but the conclusion, overall survival, disease-free survival, were similar between cord and haplo in this retrospective analysis for black patients with hematologic malignancy. So um, the next study I wanted to review was a multi-center access protocol for unlicensed cord blood units. Um, it's work that I did with uh, Steve Spellman and the group at the NMDP. Um, and actually, was uh, preliminary results were presented here um, a few years ago. I saw the picture, and I actually had the same suit on, so maybe a shopping trip is in order after the meeting. <laughs> um, but in 2011, um, as we know, the US FDA began licensure of cord blood units. And therefore, unlicensed units uh, needed an IND to be used in the US. This would be unlicensed units in the US cord blood bank or international banks. And therefore, the NMDP kindly developed a centralized IND to allow access for unlicensed units. And the preliminary endpoint of the study was neutrophil engraftment. And it was a large study of over 24 100 patients, adults, and children. children. Adults were all malignant disease, and children were malignant and non-malignant disease. 
Um, and just to review, this was sort of the premise for the study. So this is data from the NMDP. This is just looking at unrelated transplants, so not haplo. But if you look up here for black African-American cord blood representing 34% of unrelated choice, uh, uh, unrelated options, transplants um, for black patients and 10% for white. So having availability of cord blood definitely serves that population. And what we saw um, in this study is that for adults, again, these are just adults with malignant disease receiving cord blood transplant, survival was comparable among white, um, Hispanic, and black patients. For children with non-malignant disease, also survival was comparable. Um, we did see a difference in children with malignant disease uh, receiving cord blood transplant in that black children had lower survival than white or Hispanic. And this is an area of future investigation to try to look into why this is happening and how to improve this. So conclusions from this 10 CBA, CBA stands for Cord Blood Access Study. Uh, cord blood is serving a diverse population. Um, I didn't show this data, but there was no advantage to choosing a cord blood unit matched by race and ethnicity. It was the usual factors of cell dose um, and match that were important. Um, we showed improved survival for black patients compared to earlier studies th that we had done with the CIBMTR. Adult survival was similar among different racial and ethnic groups. Black children with cancer had lower survival and that is a focus of future investigations. So this is an ongoing study with the CIBMTR. Um, does race and ethnicity impact outcomes after umbilical cord blood transplant in a contemporary era? Um, so it's a CIBMTR analysis. You can see by the number that it's been going on for a few years. The goal to compare outcomes for cord blood transplant among different race and ethnicities an attempt to understand the discrepancy in outcomes that we saw among children in the other study of different racial and ethnic groups. Obviously, it's a more modern and contemporary analysis, and the final analysis is pending, so hopefully it will be something to share next year. So what can we do in this room to improve healthcare disparity? Well, I think um, for those of us that are transplant uh, physicians, we need to have expertise in multiple donor sources, cord blood, haplo, and mismatched mud. We need not to have a sort of religious conviction that we're only going to do one or the other. Most of the studies have shown that results are fairly comparable. Uh, there may be different patient populations that do better with one or another, and as Steve said in some other talks, that I think is really where some of the key analysis should be going forward. But at transplant centers, we should be able to accommodate patients with any of these graft sources and treat them successfully. Um, models of community partnership and care. I'm gonna talk about the HLA Today program and also some new data on community oncology care. Um, in the US, the NMDP provides patient assistance and there are other federal and government agencies that can provide that assistance. Clinical trial availability, which is going to be the focus of Charlie's talk. And then political and social advocacy that, that might be outside our day job, um, but of course um, we all have the opportunity to make impacts in our community um, and to advocate for you know, what we think is right. So um, another question for you, HLA today. Which statement is false? No insurance approval needed? be the match, NMDP assumes the cost, patients but not family members can be typed, and cord blood information is sent to the ordering physician. So any takers for no insurance approval needed? Uh, how about be the match, NMDP assumes the cost, patients but not family members can be typed, and cord blood information is sent to the ordering physician. Okay. <laughs> we have a little work to do here. So um, the, it's three. Um, so both patients and first degree family members will, can be typed by the NMDP and I'll describe a little bit about the program. So this is a program um, done, uh, sponsored by the NMDP. 
in an effort to get uh, patients to transplant sooner. So this is HLA typing done by a cheek swab at the local community oncology setting. So this, let's say, might be a center that does leukemia induction but doesn't have a transplant program. And so rather than the patient getting their induction, waiting a month, then waiting for an appointment and maybe getting to the transplant center six weeks after induction and getting typed there, they can get typed while they're in the hospital um, getting their induction. So save, could save about a month in terms of getting to transplant. Be the match assumes the complete cost. Uh, there's no insurance approval needed. There's no cost to the patient or to the center. And for those of us on the transplant side, that can count as one of your two HLA typings. So there could be a cost saving there at the transplant end. And it, um, patients and first degree relatives um, can be typed um, by this method. One thing is that the typing report is sent to the ordering oncologist. It's not necessarily sent to the local transplant center. Um, the oncologist can designate a transplant center of choice. So th this is, I think, sometimes can be a limiting factor and it's important for those of us at transplant centers to make sure we're communicating with all of our community oncology partners that they know that once they get the typing, if they want um, the transplant center to review it, they need to send it to us. Um, the oncologist can designate a transplant center of choice. Of course, that may not always be the closest center based on insurance and other issues. Uh, so far, the program has typed uh, uh, 767 patients, and 33% um, of those are non-white patients. So um, I would just encourage everyone to make use of this service and to communicate to your community oncologists um, um, about the opportunity um, to get patients to transplant sooner. And like I said, there's absolutely no cost to the patient or insurance. Um, this is um, work that the Be The Match does in terms of patient financial assistance. Um, it's actually pretty incredible. Um, so um, in 2021, they awarded $6.1 million in patient financial assistance to over 2,000 patients. So there is a form that um, most of the time the social workers or other um, people at the transplant center need to fill out with the patient and communicate with the NMDP but that is also another resource that helps patients pay for transportation, obviously cost of gas, very expensive, um, and other um, kind of non-insurance covered costs. And this is available um, to patients in the U.S. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, but you do need to reside in the U.S. Um, and then I want to focus on community academic partnerships. Uh, the Dana-Farber uh, just presented some preliminary data um, on this. Of course, they're in Boston and they work with many um, local oncology groups throughout um, New England and surrounding states. And they uh, did a randomized study of a shared care model versus a standard transplant center care model. The shared care model is that um, after the patient got discharged from the hospital, they went home and their care was performed mostly by their local community oncologists in communication with the transplant center and also with telehealth um, from the transplant center versus the standard model where the patient stays for an additional two months or till day 100 um, within an hour of the transplant center. Um, and uh, what they saw is that survival outcomes, short-term follow-up was similar in the two groups, but as you might expect for patients being home quality of life and patient satisfaction was much improved in a shared care model. And I think this is really where we need to be moving forward. The pandemic has um, taught us that we can do telehealth successfully. Patients like it. It's much cheaper for them. Um, obviously, there would need to be some education um, out to the um, community oncology groups so that they can monitor the things that need to be monitored. Um, but I, th and, and uh, Charlie's going to talk about clinical trials, but also a movement is so that clinical trial work doesn't always have to be done just in one center. You know, a CBC could be done at a local facility and the patient doesn't have to travel back and forth because, you know, that center's not on the 1572. So I think there's a lot that we can do in partnership uh, with local oncology practices. 
So in conclusion, um, this research is focused on the U.S., but I think the principles apply worldwide. We see a large disparity in access to transplant. We know that cord blood is a readily available stem cell source with comparable survival among different racial and ethnic groups in adults. Um, further studies, I think, needed in children. Black patients have comparable survival between cord blood and haplo. And newer programs such as HLA Today, community partnerships, and NMDP assistance to improve access. Um, thank you very much. Hello, I'm uh, Charlie Credit from Birmingham, the UK, and I'm incredibly grateful to Karen and Joanne for the invitation to give this talk. I'm so sorry I can't be joining you in person. I'd love to be there, but I'm on holiday, first post-COVID holiday with my family at the moment. So um, I'm going to be talking about how clinical trials can improve access to transplant, improve outcomes after transplant, and work to reduce healthcare disparity. These are my disclosures. So uh, by way of introduction, I think there's a growing recognition that at a time when a tsunami, really, of new drug transplant and cellular therapies are becoming available for patients with great unmet need as a result of an investment over the last 70 years of literally trillions of pounds, dollars, euros into basic science, that our clinical trial infrastructure that's required to accelerate assessment of these therapies so that patients benefit in a timely manner has failed to keep pace with the remarkable therapeutic explosion. And so this results really in, in delays in approval and adoption of new drug and cellular therapies. And in, se in stem cell transplantation, uh, cord blood transplantation, a failure to either routinely assess new and existing complex interventions using the sort of standard high-quality prospective randomized evidence that we would uh, expect of any new drug, uh, and also, I think, a, a failure to ensure that patients benefit as rapidly as possible from the investment in basic science that they and their parents and grandparents have made over the last uh, uh, number of decades. Um, and really because of this simple failure of attention to detail, when we're spending so much money on basic science, so many billions on generating CAR T-cell therapies, that the amount of money that's actually invested in the necessary trial infrastructure is so modest, reminds one of Benjamin Franklin's uh, observation that for the want of a nail, the shoe was lost, for the want of a shoe, the horse was lost, for the want of a horse, the rider was lost, for the want of a rider, the battle was lost, and for the want of a battle, the kingdom was lost, and all for the want of a horseshoe nail. So I'm going to try and propose to you today that this is actually quite a soluble problem and not too expensive to fix. So uh, as I'm uh, uh, identifying, there is, I think, an urgent requirement for innovation in trial delivery mechanisms. So if we look at the models that we've inherited from the past, well, first of all, typically industry put their really exciting new products through uh, registration quality studies delivered by the CRO sector with enhanced pharmacovigilance with the aim of securing approval by the FDA or EMA. And at the other end of the spectrum, the investigator-initiated trials asking important questions uh, still really uh, are pretty much what academic cooperative groups. The examples of academic cooperative groups getting access to these really breaking new therapies are, are quite modest. But if I, you're thinking about it from a patient perspective, they're less interested in the semantics of what the trial is called. What they want is, regardless of whether it's an industry-sponsored trial or an academic IT, is they want new treatments assessed as quickly as possible. And they also want to understand how current existing treatments can be deployed as successfully as possible. And we, we all know from personal experience and from accounts how, although the global CRO sector has uh, certainly successes, that it's struggling really to respond to this new therapeutic landscape characterized by increasing genomic segmentation, 
partly because of their limited clinical involvement. They may arrive just out of nowhere. You don't know these folk. Uh, the monitors it doesn't help. There's little integrated science, typically in a, a CRO-sponsored uh, trial, and they're often unnecessary, complex, and expensive. And at the same time, we know that our university trial system really struggles to deliver the quality of data, particularly safety data that's required for registration of therapies. And at the same time, university-based trials units suffer the challenges that all universities have in terms of speed uh, and efficiency and responsiveness. So there's a requirement for innovation and there's an opportunity to innovate. And that's happening in front of our eyes. Uh, what a number of academic cooperative groups across the world are successfully showing us is that, in fact, you can realize the key strategic assets that we have. Huge pop access to huge populations, KOL engagement, insights in terms of trial design, and, and, and pivotally embedded translational studies, which are now often important in getting FDA or EMA approval. So we have those assets, but what we need to layer onto that is the sort of quality system, speed, that a CRO might bring to a trial so that the data that you generate is of registration quality. But groups across the world are doing that now. Hovon in the Netherlands is showing everybody the heels in terms of AML therapies. And they are delivering registration standard trials through an academic network. LISARC is the French lymphoma group. There's a, a European myeloma consortium that is working as an academic consortium, but is generating a whole uh, portfolio of such studies. And of course, the US BMT CTN are innovating in this area. So what we can see is a recognition that if we get that infrastructure right, we invest appropriately in generating the quality of data that a CRO would typically get. We have advantages. So let me just quickly show you some of the advantages. This was the recovery trial delivered by uh, Sir Martin Landra in the UK in, in the context of COVID. And it does show you how quick we can be. This was an academic study. But the first patient was enrolled nine days after the protocol was written. Uh, so that was because of uh, regulatory uh, urgency, uh, investment through research nurses in many large hospitals, and also a nice pragmatic trial design. So this study was pivotal in terms of showing steroids benefited patients with COVID and, and a number of others. So it is possible. So let's turn to transplant. Well, you know, we, we know this is such a key curative modality in children and adults whether it's using cord blood, unrelated donor source, haploidentical or autologous cells. But we also know that more than 50% of patients after a transplant will die of a procedural toxicity or relapse. And yet fewer than, in the UK, fewer than 5% of patients enter prospective randomised studies designed to uh, uh, understand how we can improve patient outcomes. What we typically have relied on in the transplant field is registry studies. Well, they, they have clearly got value, but there's a lot of challenge in terms of uh, potential um, bias, potential selective sampling, uh, and really actually delivering any uh, significant embedded translational studies. I think the BMT-CTN network has really been um, you know, a model in terms of showing how one can develop a prospective trials network delivering practice-informing studies in transplant. But we have challenges. So if we were to think of what would be the areas that we would wish to ask, I mean, I think we want to understand how to do transplants better so more people survive free of disease. In, in allogeneic transplant, the major challenge, I think, is reducing the risk of relapse and reducing the risk of GBHD. We know also that these prospective studies can allow us to do really transformative science. I think also we have to be focusing as an absolute priority on how we can increase access to transplant, and I'll be talking about that a little, using either cord blood or novel GBHD strategies. So if we just look in the setting of AML, I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes talking about AML. What could we do in terms of interventions? 
well, we could have a randomized study that looks at trying to reduce MRD burden before patients go to transplant. We could think about conditioning regimens, or we could think about maintenance therapy, something that augments a graph versus tumor effect. They're all fairly simple, randomized studies, and yet there's very little data in this space to inform how we can improve transplant outcomes in AML. One, just one example, you'll be aware in uh, acute myeloid leukemia, the use of what's called a FLAMSA sequential condition regimen. It came out of Germany, really nice idea that before a RIC allograft, you debulk with fludarabin, and uh, amsacrine and cytarabin. And the results that were published in high-risk AML in the phase one, two study were by Christoph Schmidt were really fantastic. And so on the basis of this data, this became the go-to regimen in many European transplant centers, despite the fact it's another week in hospital, there's significant toxicity, and there was no randomized data. And at the same time, you will have had discussions in your MDT like ours about what do we do with patients who are pre-transplant MRD positive? Should they have chemo? Should we wait? Should we go to transplant? And the reason uh, is because we haven't had until recently a very good data set. There's lots of retrospective data looking at the impact of pre-transplant MRD on transplant outcome. You can see the effect size in some of these studies is huge, but it's quite variable. And the quality of these studies really is limited by the fact they were simply retrospective analyses. It was what samples did we have in the freezer on these patients, and there's all sorts of inherent bias. So in a study called Figaro that we closed out and published last year, delivered by the UK uh, NCRI group, we asked a simple question in patients with AML in CR1 or CR2 who were randomized to a standard reduced intensity transplant, either Flubu2 or Flumelcampath, compared with a, a Flamsbu regimen with two-year overall survival, was there a benefit? But we also used this as an opportunity to ask the first prospectively uh, examination of what was the impact of pre-transplant flow MRD on transplant outcome. So to cut to the chase, uh, there was, despite the fact that this had rapidly become a standard regimen in many countries, no evidence of benefit incidence of relapse was the same, regardless of whether you're MRD positive pre-transplant or not, the overall survival was the same. Uh, what we were able to do by pooling these uh, sample sets was to demonstrate, and this is Sylvie Freeman's beautiful work, that yes, there is an increased risk of relapse if you're pre-transplant MRD positive, but it's not as high as you might think. So the cumulative incidence of relapse goes, if you're MRD negative, 20%, goes up, doubles to 40% if you're MRD positive. Um, but these over, two-year overall survival is still actually not bad in this population, 51% for the MRD positive. So we feel that this isn't evidence to suggest that you should postpone transplant, rather you should go to transplant and think about how you manipulate the transplant uh, after the stem cells are infused. So our conclusions from this study was, well, this was the first randomized study of this intensive regimen, no benefit, big savings to patients, but also to the NHS, millions of pounds a year. First perspective evaluation, first perspective evaluation of the impact of pre-transplant flow MRD on outcomes. This study has informed future trials that we're delivering in the UK in this space. And the other thing we learned was there was a real appetite from patients for entry into such studies if they were open, and also by clinicians. So let's just come around to the centrally important question about how can we increase access to transplant, particularly for populations who don't have well-characterized, matched, unrelated donors or sibling donors. And this very important study that Bronwyn Shaw led from the NMDP showing that in patients having an allograph from a highly mismatched unrelated donors using post-transplant cyclophosphamide, there were some very encouraging outcomes. And so this study is a randomized study now examining the benefit of post-transplant cyclophosphamide in this setting, and gratifyingly it's accruing very well. And you could plausibly see this as being a very important way to increase uh, the donor pool for patients from uh, uh, certain ethnic groups who currently 
are very poorly served in terms of access to transplant. Another area I think is in the setting of cord blood transplantation and the data from Juliet Barker's group really is very promising indeed using an intermediate intensity double unit cord approach in uh, adults uh, I think to in the, up to their 60s with high risk acute myeloid leukemia and really very promising survival rates um, uh, uh, very modest toxicity in GBHD but the challenge of course is this is not a randomized study and so again if we could get ourselves together with the proper trials infrastructure one could see this study being delivered with real practice informing intent. So what we were uh, intent on doing in the UK and this was an idea that started in 2010 was to try and build a transplant trial infrastructure for UK patients it took seven years from the idea to get 3.4 million. It's about $5 billion. It took us seven years to get $5 billion from three charities. The aim of this uh, impact transplant trial initiative was to open about nine to 12 transplant trials to recruit about 400 patients, deliver high quality CRFs and help translational research. So the way we did this was uh, part of the money went to investment core investment up front into research nurses in major transplant centers through an open peer review process on the condition that these patients would receive a patient information sheet for every uh, transplant study we'd open they were eligible for that we actually had high quality crf return and also that um, good translational samples returned we were able through this uh, peer review process to have a very nice covering in the red dots across the uk an impact what's it done well it opened i mean it's, it's only a bit more, more than four years old um it's opened seven studies um one pro dli randomized study of dli post transplants closed the uh, amadeus and cosi studies are asking questions about conditioning regimen and also amadeus looking at post transplant cc486 they're going to close in uh, two, two by by the end of this year and the other studies as a you see a recruiting nicely and we're delighted that we've got more than 1200 patients now randomized just having set this up four years ago four and a half years ago what can a, what can this network do for you well this is a really important dli study and what we saw there if you look at the red curve was until the study was opened in the impact network very very slow rates of recruitment as soon as you open it in these sites you can see the red bar shoot up and in fact the study recruited early so what's the impact of a uh, research nurse well these are the funded centers with research nurses and you can see how it completely transforms recruitment compared with centers that don't have that funding so what do we learn from this well the first was that it is possible to drive really quite rapid recruitment to pivotal randomized studies in transplant that for a modest investment you've got more than a thousand patients being treated on these trials that the research nurse network is of critical importance we are delivering really great science because of prospective well curated sample collection and it's leveled up access to innovative therapies for all patients from all communities across the uk we then wanted to understand because this was philanthropically funded how could we create a sustainable funding mechanism and for that we have got investment of five million pounds from three charities to set up two vehicles. Both are, one is a trials delivery vehicle, which is a company limited by guarantee, commercially effective, mutualized, run on a Quaker principle, financial, financial surplus going back into the community. Uh, and, and that's called ACT, Accelerating Clinical Trials Limited, uh, www.actforpatients.com. So this is meant to be doing everything a CRO does in terms of commercial flexibility and speed to create a financially sustainable model within three years to fund the research nurse networks and increase access to novel therapies and really to keep this honest to make sure that the trials that are delivered by ACT are those prioritized by academic clinicians. There's a matching foundation in which clinicians and philanthropy and experts and colleagues and stem cell registers sit to prioritize the trials that we wish to deliver through this uh, transplant trial network and also to advise how any financial surplus is reinvested and also to think about uh, 
training the next generation, but finally to sponsor academic IITs. So, so in summary, I think I hope I've been able to persuade you that for a modest investment, we've been able to deliver a, a really very effective, rapidly recruiting transplant and cell therapy network. That this, we hope, is a benefit to patients, certainly delivering high quality randomized data, and that we wish to create a financial sustainable model. And we wish to do that through these two new vehicles, ACT, a commercially viable, competitive company, trial delivery company, matched with the Didact Foundation. And our focus is to ask questions that improve outcomes for patients and increase access to transplant and also to improve outcomes in cord blood transplants. And finally, I want to thank the funders, the leadership, particularly David Marks, Ron Chakravarti, Victor Potter, Wendy Ingram, the brilliant trial leadership, all our fantastic nurses, and most importantly, our patients. And thank you for your attention. Um, great. I'd uh, love to take some questions. And just when you come up, just introduce yourself. I'm Gesine Kögler from Düsseldorf, and uh, we are both having bone marrow donor registry, sending out several transplants and also Cordbot Bank. And my question is, when you do the HLA analysis, do you compare the HLA haplotypes you have, or do you take the information just what you get from the donor centers? Good question. It's a haplotype-based analysis model. So the haplotypes are imputed for all of the donors and then expanded from there to develop the genotypes to determine the match levels. Okay, because what we noticed, we always check the background of the patient and also of the grafts, that frequently one haplotype is very... Um, is a rare haplotype if it's Hispanic, and the other haplotype is a more common haplotype. So, yeah. yeah. And you consider then if you have a frequent haplotype and a rare haplotype, how you consider then this transplant? N not necessarily from a, a rare from a frequency standpoint, but it's it's what is the likely haplotype for for an individual, and then really discerning or imputing the, the genotype from that and matching from that. So not necessarily looking at rare versus common. That is additional work that has been done, but for the registry modeling, it, that hasn't entered into the, into the models okay. at this point. Thank you. Other questions? So Steve, I, I have one for sure. you. Um, it, it seems to me the, the sort of um, nirvana out there would be some sort of personalized um, medicine approach. Um, I know we've talked about this before. I give the analogy to breast cancer where you kind of stick everything into the computer and, you know, the answer comes out. Do you think we have the knowledge and the data, you know, to get there for transplant decision making? I think we're on the path to get there. Um, so there have been some tools that have been released that are tied to specific analyses that aren't, it's, that can help provide some of that guidance. So I mentioned the center-specific outcome analysis. There is an overall survival calculator that's available on the CIBMTR website that's, that's been tied to that analysis, and it's updated on an annual basis where you can put in the characteristics of your patient and the available donor option and get an, an, an estimate of what the likely survival would be at one year. That's one way to go about it. But um, then being able to take all of the donor characteristics or donor and patient characteristics and give the best selection, the best option. Um, we have a, a program that's been ongoing at, at the National Marrow Donor Program for a couple years, a strategic project um, that we call DOTS affectionately, uh, Donor Optimization for Transplant Success. Um, we're, we're applying the, the findings from research studies to prioritize donors within the search list, but another work effort that's part of that is machine learning, AI-assisted uh, evaluation of 
ways to optimize and automate that donor, donor selection process as well with the understanding of what, what the various options are. That's a work in progress, um, but we're, we're hopeful and, and confident that we can, we can make some uh, headway on that in the coming years. So stay tuned. Great, thanks. That'll be next year's meeting. <laughs> Marcy. Hi, thank you both for a great session, Karen. Thanks for organizing it. I think, you know, we're all inherently think about access to transplant. And I'll say from a core blood banking perspective, it's really challenging. So our bank has worked to have collection sites across the country to in, um, increase our diversity in our bank. And we've actually been successful at that. But one thing that's a challenge for us is we see that still the big high TNC Caucasian units are the ones that get transplanted. So that makes it really challenging for us to try to decide where to put our efforts. Do you have any insight on um, how we can do a better job of making sure we have the units that are going to best serve the populations that need them? Um, I would just say from the data that we have looked at, race ethnicity matching is not as important as big. So. Um, that, that's at least, I think, what the data that we've looked at uh, suggests so far. I don't know, Steve, if you want to comment. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I mean, uh, banking the largest units that, that you can, uh, regardless of race and ethnicity, will serve the majority of patients. Um, so that has, has been kind of the findings from the RAND analyses that were done in the past, as well as some modeling that's been done through, through the NMDP. Um, and that's what's being ordered at this point. So got to respond to the to the needs of the the field as well very true thanks great session what are your comments about continuing to collect cord blood so we've heard multiple times about the supply and demand being out of balance right but in terms of diversity it seems that we need to continue collecting because you know, the population is exponentially diversifying, and those babies that are born today are going to be serving the patients of tomorrow, yet can we do that economically, and how do we make that happen? Just comments, interested. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we got the answer to this one. <laughs> uh, Steve, why, why don't you, uh, why don't you uh, give well, it a I go? Get, I get to take that yeah. first. Um, that's, that's a tough question, Donna. I mean, in, in this current economic climate, it's, it's, it, it's hard when, when we're seeing declines in, in interest, um, how, being able to support that that effort. Uh, so, I mean, uh, at this meeting, there's been discussion around uh, uh, looking at alternative uses of core blood. Are there ways to be able to uh, utilize those smaller units and and make them well? <laughs> Uh, get some economic benefit from that to be able to feed the recruitment of larger units. And so I think if there are, there are strategies, cellular therapy strategies, et cetera, that could potentially use that, that inventory, that's a way to potentially increase the, the uh, funding that's available for that recruitment effort going forward. Um, that's one thought. Yeah, I, I think it's think? a very difficult question, um, but I think many banks um, have made financial decisions to consolidate or to limit recruitment or to stop um, recruiting new donors but using their inventory. So in some ways the market has made that decision. Um, I, I do think that there will always be a need for some cord blood units and it seems the market is for bigger units, and so as those leave inventory, they need to be replaced. I think as we see some of the data presented, um, like Steve mentioned, and we heard yesterday, in autism and cerebral palsy and stroke, these are very common diseases. They're much more common than hematologic cancers. So if, if these if the phase three studies are successful, I think that will change the paradigm. For, for cord blood, but I think right now the economics of the situation are limiting many banks from collecting. How's that for a non-answer? <laughs> Other questions? Well, great, well, thanks very much uh, for your attention and uh, we'll see you back in half an hour.